Ajay, but I'm on time today. It's good to see everyone again in COT. That is counciloftime.com, the one and only, the scoffers market, the target. Keep telling these scoffers they might want to make a million anti-Council of Time sites because that just won't go away. I won't go away. Folks, it was a, Pastor Scott, thank you for the praise and, and worship. You know, sometimes we get in there and uh, I'll tell you, things begin to happen. I like that. I was also grateful for, um, always grateful for Pastor Paul's show. He's a very insightful individual. And you know what? Once, once people's imaginations burn out, they're no good. Nothing they thought of comes to pass. Well, then, people will understand portions of prophecy a lot of ways. And tell the conspiracy style, like this uh, July 20th deal, right? And everybody was asking me and everybody else about July 20th. And they said, do you know anything about July 20th? And, of course, I said, I do not. I have no idea about July 20th. Except that it's, you know, July 20th. That's it. That's all I know about it. It was Sunday. That was it. But when all these little conspiracy theories burn out, they'll search the truth. And you know what's a good thing? Because we do have imaginations. We have to deal with imaginations. And once the imaginations burn out, because we naturally want the truth of everything, and sometimes we come up with our own theories, because there's a lack of proof out there for us to search for. But I take the Lord's advice to wait upon Him, to wait upon the Lord. And whatever He gives you will in time manifest. If it came from Him, it's not going to fail. It's just simply not going to fail. If He gives you something, it's not going to fail. It just simply won't fail. We serve a um, loving God. But you know what? Yesterday, we were pinpointing some characteristics of the enemy, the children of the evil one, versus the children of God. And again, that was found, that was found in um, Matt, or, yeah, Matthew 13, 37 through 43. And it's really, it's, a, it's, it's good to know that there are two types of people in this world. Number one, so you don't walk around with questions in your head, asking yourself questions like, I, I can't believe this person acts this way, or I can't believe this, or this is just stunning. This, this person is, uh, you know, wow, where'd that come from? You don't need to walk around like that. The Lord does not want his children walking around in circles insecure concerning his word. And so you know what? His wisdom is found in his gospels. His prescribed way of life is found in his gospels, which is the message of salvation. Now, as a Christian, there is a prescribed way to walk. There is the consideration of a Christian. There are characteristics of a true believer. There's the beginning of the commission. There's your armament. And there are examples of how to walk out the commission, as you were called. Not to think up new ways to do things. We don't need to do that. We're operating in a world of which God already governs everything. The path has already been made. What he came to do, he finished. The truth be told, the entire story is finished. In order for us to succeed in serving him in that capacity, we want to serve him in. We must follow his prescribed way. You know what? You can liken it to an individual, to an individual, making roads all over the earth. Let's just say one individual made roads all over the earth. The same individual set up cities all over the earth. Right? He set up cities all over the earth. You want to know how to get from point A to point B. But you don't want to listen to the guy that created everything. You don't 
believe him because you can't see him. You can't trust him because you don't know him. So what you do is you go through every road you can go through and never find the city. You've even gone to the city, showed up at the wrong side and swore up and down it was not the city you were looking for. So you theorize your way through life, taking every road, but the road he made for you to take to get to the city. He designed all the paths in life, yet we still won't listen to him. We won't listen to him. He knows how to get there, but we still won't listen to him. We think we know a better route. We think we have discovered the truth. And where does it lead us? To the wrong city. To the wrong place. To the wrong place. That's where it leads us. He said, don't take the broad, you, you don't take the broad path of which many take to that road of destruction. The gate that he provides us, that road that he provides us is narrow. He said, few men find it. Few men find it. Why? Because they don't trust him. They trust themselves. You throw your computer out the window. If it didn't respond like you wanted it to. In other words, you type an A in and an X pops up. You backspace and a whole letter is typed out. You throw it out the window. You say, something's wrong with this. You'd recycle your own computer, delete the hard drive. You'd destroy it, right? Why? Because it's yours. You'd destroy it if it does not function. As you set it up or bought it to function, you bought it to function a certain way. you destroy it. Unfortunately, the Lord loved us all. But in the end, all those who rejected him, all those who chose their own path, they will go where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Period. That's where they're going to go. Where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth because they refused to take the prescribed way Jesus told us. And look, in his way, he accepts all the burden of that walk. And that's something. There's no burden in that walk. You walk outside of his will, you carry everything. You're hoping. You're protecting your back from the many knives everybody carries. You're doing all sorts of things. And when you think you have found success, something tears down your life. You're constantly searching and never finding. You're only never satisfied. And it takes one being in that walk to actually determine that's a ridiculous walk. It leads to nowhere. You would think that most of your depressed people would not be millionaires. But that's not the case. Most depressed people who are not happy, who don't feel fulfilled, are millionaires. Anyway, folks, we're going to say a prayer, then I'll get started. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. And amen. You know what's something? The Lord that created all things, by his word do all things exist. You see, without his word, nothing would exist. There would be no existence. But through his word, things exist. And his own creation challenges him. It challenges him. But it's also exposing the hearts of men. You know, there's a scripture about those who would challenge what the, what, what the Lord had written in these books. In fact, in Luke uh, 24, 25, he said, Oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all, the pro all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things? and to enter into his glory. You know, you can extract out of that that what he gave the prophets is real, is truthful. And Jesus himself called them fools for not believing what the prophets have spoken. See, they didn't believe either. That's why he talked down or was condemning the lawyers 
the Pharisees, you see, they made their choice. They want to rule men. They want to sway men to come over to their ideas. And that's really what it's all about. Control. The root of that is control. Control. See, if you have control, you can oppress, and the person has no... They have no alternative but to deal with that oppression. You can also deliver us a sense of power that men seek. The children of God do not seek that type of power. They don't seek that type of power. You know, there's a conduct. Now, last night we separated the two. We separated the two. The tares in the field. Let me read. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and then which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoso hath ears, let him hear. That's Matthew thirteen thirty seven through 43. By the Lord Jesus telling us that there are good seeds, which are the children of the kingdom, and there are tares, which are the children of the wicked one, well, then that means the wicked one has children on earth side by side with you. Two distinct types of people. This is why some people are capable of the most horrible things. Yet, there are some people who cannot conceive of why someone would be so terrible. But here's what's happening today. Men can no longer hide what's in their hearts. They can't. The treasure of a man's heart is slowly coming out of their mouths. And you know what it says in Luke uh, 6.45? It says this, A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is good. An evil man, out of the evil treasures of his heart, bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaketh. And you know what a lot of people these days, they're doing both. What's in them is coming out, they can no longer hide it. There was a time where people went through trials for teaching. But now it seems people are stuck with the identity. And whatever was in the darkness is coming out into the light. Whatever was said in secret is going to be heard publicly. In Luke 12, 2, it says this. It says this. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in the darkness shall be heard in the light. And that which ye have spoken in the ear, in the closet, shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. That's a heavy statement. And you know what it said before that? You know what it said before that? Jesus said, Beware ye of the leaving of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. You see, it's their hypocrisy that's going to come out. Their hypocrisy, which is going to come out. Their hypocrisy. Which means your ears are going to be open. Your ears are going to be open to the words of the Father. You're going to hear them clearly. You're going to understand them. That cloud of confusion will leave you. You will understand the Father's words, which will bring out these vile sayings of those who do not belong to the Lamb. The Father will open your ears, and you will be able to hear. You will not have that cloud of confusion. You see, because a lot of men are swayed by ideas. One of the powers of men on earth is through their imagination. 
that can cause a cloud of, of clutter over someone's mind. And then they go and hear somebody else say something contrary to anything that's in the Word. It adds a seed of doubt. And when you see all that's going to be exposed. Just as science is running out of excuses to explain the happenings around the world, so will the sayings of the vile people, those Pharisees who operate in hypocrisy. They're hypocrites because they proclaim the peace and the love of Jesus. Yet out of their same mouths, they condemn and judge and ruthlessly attempt to kill others who are in their way. Their father is the devil. Yes, I just said that. Their father is the devil. And the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy, and they're doing, they're doing the work of their daddy, the devil. They're doing the work of their daddy. They're doing the devil's work. They challenge God's word. They change it and conform it to their own belief system to suit their feelings. They're doing the work of the enemy. But you see, the Lord's people, there's a prescribed way. For example, if you turn to Luke, I'm going to turn there real quick to Luke 6. Really good chapter, Luke 6. You see, because the prescribed way that Jesus gave us, it takes no guesswork. You don't need a great formula. It's right there. It's simple to understand. Very simple. I'm going to start with 26, or, or 27. Jesus says, But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies. Do good to them which hate you. Now that was, Jesus is telling you how you need to be as a child of God. He's telling you how you need to be as a child of God. Bless them that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you. Now let's be honest. How many of us do this? How many of us do this? Listen to me. Bless them that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you. You know what we do? Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just tell you. You know what we do? We go in our prayer closet and say, Lord, go get them. Go cast them into the furnace. Make them fail some kind of way. Listen to me. That is not what the children of the Most High do. That's not what you do. But that's exactly what we pray for. We say things like that. Lord, I just wish you would, you would just expose them for what you are. But you see... We'll be exposed, too, for what we are. Our hypocrisy will be made known. We can't pray those vain prayers as though God is some uh, uh, cruel God. He is not. He is merciful. Now, if he's merciful towards us in our sinful, filthy bodies, he's going to be merciful toward all men. This said, bless them that curse you. Pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. Him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. You know what? These things are impossible without the love of God within you. You can't do these things without the love of God. You can't. People don't love their enemies. They don't love their enemies. People want their enemies to pay. I see this every single day. Every single day, people want their enemies to, to pay the ultimate price. They don't love their enemies. Now, Jesus is telling us how to live our lives. He's giving us a prescribed way that he prescribed. By the way, he is the Son of God. He's the Son of God. All authority was given to him. No one can go through the Father except through him. It's the way of a child of God. Outside of that way, you're a heathen. This is what we need to be learning. We need to apply this to our lives. 
Most people have love within them. But they look around before they do an act of love. They look around and gauge and say, these people might think I'm crazy or this group won't agree with that and they'll shun me. You know what? We fear the consequences of the public more than we do our God. We absolutely fear the consequences of the public more than we fear the Lord our God. We can no longer afford to be that way. It takes away from your walk. It adds worry to your life. It adds a sense, a gap. You don't have that closeness with the Father, that security, that confidence in Him. It'll be shaken. Verse 30, Get to every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. In other words, now you just read what that said, right? How many people sue other people? Listen to what it says. Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. Ask them not again. Now, we definitely don't do that because if someone came into our houses and took a fork, we would have a problem with it and a story. In other words, we like our stuff. We have accountability of our stuff. But here's a question. What's worth more, your fellow man or your stuff? Because all too often we put our stuff over our fellow man. We do. We put our stuff over our fellow man. People can wash their car. Someone could need a ride somewhere. You know, we'll say, oh, well, i got to wait till the wax dries. That's what we'll say. Or i got to wait till this is, uh, you know, cooled off or done or whatever. That's ridiculous. There were times I just washed my vehicle and something popped up and took it right into the mud because I simply did. You know what? I found out something. If you place material things over the will of the Father, which is to do good to those who hate you and despitefully use you, to give to those who ask of you, in other words, to be a child of God, is to be the definition of humane. If you place materials over that, you'll be stripped of all of them. You'll be hard-pressed to keep what you have. See, early, early in my life, I was hard-headed. I was extremely hard-headed. And I went through a great many things. The Lord made me consider what he was talking about. That same spirit that a great many people possess of challenging the word of God. Because they may be academically savvy. Is a bad thing. But they too will be taught. It just so happens that time may not be on the side, or our side as we may think. Material things can be replaced, but you know what I'm telling you now? You can have everything you want in your life and be miserable at the same time because your soul will be void. I'm telling you what I know. Your soul will be empty and void. No fulfillment. That's why a great many people, they can reminisce back when they had struggles. And if they honestly consider it, they can say, you know, we had a better, we had a more uh, a, a, a fulfilled life then than we do now. What happened? What happened? We didn't have much, but we were fulfilled. What happened? Now that we have what we need, we're separated. What's going on here? The world says the quality of life goes up when all your needs are met, right? That's what the world says. I don't believe that. I don't believe it because possessions can be a distraction. Do you know why people work so hard? They don't work so hard for you. They work for their possessions. 
Think about going to a job and what you pay off for your house and your car and car insurance and other things that you get. Your, all your credit card payments and all this. All that's going towards possession. What you possess. Your time, your eight-hour days are going towards your possessions. That's where it's going. To your possessions. And see, now when you have increased the lifestyle in front of many, you know what you end up doing? You protect your status in society. Because you don't want to see anybody see you go revert and go backwards. You know why? Because everybody's scared of one word. They're scared of being called a failure. They don't want to be known as a failure. See, when you come to the Lord, you've already been shunned and pushed aside. Your ideas are different. You don't believe the way everybody else believes. So then you come to the Lord and you find a type of freedom, a different type of people, people who are loving, people who don't chastise you like the world does, people who don't function like the world does. But then something happens. You see, when we begin to enjoy each other, we can't help ourselves but to attempt to say who's in charge. Well, that's the first thing that starts. Who's in charge? Then when somebody's in charge, we'll say, well, we need a structure. Then we start throwing men's traditions back in to what was developed. We do this in our homes, too. Then we start building up stuff, just stuff all over the place, stuff. And then if we're not careful, we find that we're investing our time yet again in stuff. And stuff again. And so the quality of your life begins to go down. Why? Because you're spending most of your time protecting your stuff. I want you to think of something. The average person, the prepper, the average prepper, will shoot anybody who attempts to what? Take their stuff. Here's a dilemma. If you trust in the Lord your God to be a provider... Why are you trying to save your substance on earth when he's your provider? A lot of people find it difficult to trust God because they don't know the method in which he delivers. That's the problem. They don't know how he delivers to them what he does. They can't trust him. They can only trust what they see. But I don't know anybody who can see exactly what God's doing in their life because a lot of blessings come from different... In fact, most of the true blessings come from places you didn't... It, it was just not in your mind. You thought it may come from one direction, but it didn't. It came from something you knew nothing about. But again, Jesus gave us a prescribed way. We need to reflect on our lives and remember every good thing that the Lord has done for us. That's how you can find out who he is. When you find out, listen, a person who is not merciful to anybody else does not know God is merciful. He doesn't. A person who is not ready to give does not know God as a provider. If you know God as a provider, then you know your provisions will always be there through him. Therefore, you don't try to hold on to things in your hands. But you do give away without thought. You give away everything of your time and everything else because you know God as a provider. But if you don't know God as a provider, you hold on to everything you have. And the reason could be because you simply forgot how he provided for you in the past. You see, he told Israel. He told them. He said, the day you forget how I bought you out of Egypt. I'm paraphrasing. It's the day you're going to go back into your ways. You know, we too have forgotten what the Lord has delivered us out of. How he stood in the gap in a great many situations. How he came to us. And some of you know what I'm talking about. You were sick. And you said, oh, God, this is so uncomfortable. Just say, oh, you didn't say let me die. You said, oh, Lord, please just heal me. This hurts too bad. And he did it. 
He did it. But you know what? If we forget those things, we're not very sympathetic to those who are suffering, are we? We tend to put a blind eye out there in the world. We can't see anything else. Then we get self-consumed. And if we're not careful, we live our lives in a bubble that's absent from God. A delusion. That's what the bubble is. A delusion. Now, we have these characteristics, these prescribed ways, conduct of a believer, so to speak, right? to love your enemies, bless them that curse, curse you, pray for them and despitefully use you, land hoping for nothing again, that's a rough one. Here's one, be ye therefore merciful as your Father is also merciful. You know what the Lord is telling us how to be. Be merciful, as your Father in heaven is also merciful. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Now, you know what? If the Lord says these things, and the opposite is true, that means if you judge, you will. If, if you judge someone, you're going to be judged back. If you condemn someone, you're going to be condemned. And let me clue you in on something. Normally, when the Lord allows Satan to operate in your life, it's at the wrong time. So if you've judged someone in that same measure, you're going to be judged. But at the wrong time. If you condemn someone, you will be condemned. But at the wrong time, when I say at the wrong time, I mean it's the worst, most possible time you could ever imagine. The, the most, the worst time you could possibly imagine. Then it says, forgive, and you shall be forgiven. And you know what the Lord Jesus already said? If you don't forgive, your Father in heaven won't forgive you either. Some people walk around with a death mark on them. You know why? Because they fail to forgive a situation, and the entire time they have failed to forgive, their, the, the Father has not forgiven them of anything. The entire time they've been living in unforgiveness. And if they were to die in unforgiveness, you're not forgiven and you will not go to heaven. You will go where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Be deceived. Don't you be deceived. And he gave a list of those who are not going into the kingdom. Now, Jesus is telling us how to live our lives, how to walk as a child of God. How to walk as a child of God. So, there are some things we have to overcome and see. We need to see these things. Get past these obstacles and be real, a real child of God. Because the kingdom of God has to do with the children of God. And remember yesterday we read in Matthew 18, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as a little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Offenses, hurtful things, are in the mouth of a great many people. But the Bible is specific in saying, Woe to the person of whom these offenses come. Because it would be better if that person would not have been born. You know, that's a heavy statement. <laughs> If you offend someone or hurt someone, hurting their hearts, it'd be better if you had not been born. Here's the difference in, now I'm not talking about reading God's word and then that hurts a person. That's not what I'm talking about. We know when we hurt a person. We know when we hurt a person. There are some things that we have to do. You know what? There's still such 
there's still a term. There's a term that says, that says, name blotted out of the Lamb's Book of Life. That's a spooky term. That's a scary term. You know, a lot of people think, well, once you're saved, you can you can just never. Yes, you can, because every day you're given a choice. Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. He that endures unto the end, the same shall be saved. That's what it says. He that endures until the end, the same shall be saved. What that means? If you don't endure, if you don't walk that prescribed way of life, if you don't grow into that, and you just give up, and you faint, that means it's too rough for you. It was never your call, because listen, there, there are only two types of people. Only two types. Two types of folks. But here's the key. If we're going to be, if we accept the gift of salvation, surely we have looked into the person who offered salvation, which is Jesus Christ. And if we look into the person of Jesus Christ, surely... We have read what he requires of us. These are simple things he requires. These are prescribed ways. This is a prescribed way. You see, here's a fact. A lot of us still don't like our enemies. We don't like them. We don't want anything to do with them, right? But a prescribed way of life is not going to continue. It's a prescribed way. He's telling us how to, what, what goal we have for ourselves. We all have enemies. And for some enemies, it's hard to love. It, it really is hard to love some of your enemies. But it's possible when well, the Lord will not have told us to do it. It's very difficult if somebody smacks, if somebody punched you on the left side of your face. And the Bible's saying, turn to him the right also. Okay, that, that's, a, that's impossible without the Spirit of God fully manifested in one's life. But it's a goal we can strive for. It's still a goal we can strive for. And that statement within itself says a lot. The world and people throw many punches at you. They smack you in the face all the time. Not physically. But in a, a great multitude of ways they do this. And you know what we do? You know what we do? We engage in a fight. And Jesus is saying, don't do that. Don't engage in, the, in that fight. Don't engage in that fight. That's what the Lord is saying. These are, these are a prescribed way for the children. And if we love him, will desire to achieve that way. We will. Now, mind you, Peter tried it. It just didn't work out too well. But in the end, when he got older, you know, it, was, it started to work. No one's saying you're going to get this overnight. But the one thing you need to get is forgiveness. You need to start with forgiveness. Because I'm telling you, that's a death sentence. If, if your father, listen, the Lord is clear on what he said. He gave a parable that he forgave the debt. He said it was a man who forgave the debt of a servant. And the servant was happy because he forgave the debt. But that same servant went out into the world and demanded payment from all who owed him. Then the word got back to his master. And when he went back to his master, he was condemned and thrown with their sweeping and gnashing of teeth. If the Lord forgave you, and you fail to forgive someone else, you're not going to heaven. You're not. I want you to think about something. The Lord Jesus died on the cross for you. Who are you to withhold your forgiveness for anybody else? You see, we don't deserve, we didn't deserve anything. There's one thing we deserve in this world. You know what that is? We deserve death. Without Jesus Christ, we would pay for the sins of our fathers and fathers, fathers and fathers. You could be squeaky clean and you would still be guilty. 
because somebody in your bloodline broke the law. And the penalty of breaking the law is death. And we deserve death. But now we have an advocate with the Father. Yet some people, walking in pride, thinking that someone owes them something, when God gave them life for free, they fail to forgive. That's what they have to get right. That's the first thing they have to get right. They have to get that right. You have to forgive. Once you do that, a great burden will lift up your life. You know, I see so many people walking around with burdens in their life. That's why they're not happy. That's why they're not joyful inside. This is why they're angry. And to be angry at your brother is to be a murderer. And no murderer will enter the kingdom of God. No murder. Hatred and anger against your brother. By the Bible's teachings is murder. Murder. If you, there's no way, by the way, that you can hate your brother or hate your neighbor and say you love God. Because to love God is to love all your brothers and sisters. So something must have went wrong somewhere. Something went wrong. You see, the Bible says, be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. You become a new creature in Christ. But the Lord said something very specific. He said, why call me Lord? And do not the things which I say. Who is saying these things? The Lord is. What did Jesus say in verse 46 of Luke? Chapter 6, 46. He said, why call me Lord? And do not the things which I say. Then he said in 49, But he that heareth and doth not is like a man that is without a foundation, built in house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell into ruin, and the ruin of that house was great. You're done for. Like, but the other guy, who heard his sayings and did them, he is like a man which built a house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon, upon that house, and it could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. There are a lot of people who say, well, I'm reading it, but I can't do this. And then in 46, the, the Lord just said, and why call me Lord and do not the things which I say? That's what the Lord is saying. These words are not in here for us to just look at, to say we know them, but to do them. If we're children of the Father through Jesus Christ, we're children, right? Because we're born into sin, which means we're born in separation of the Father. Kind of sounds like adoption. Doesn't it sound like adoption? If you're born separated from the Father, and through Christ you got back, that sounds like adoption. So why won't he adopt why won't we adopt his ways? Why do we still hold on to our flawed philosophies? Why? Why do we cling to the ways of the world? That's a question you can ask yourself. Why in the world do I cling to the ways of the world? Why do I challenge God's word as though the way I have learned is flawless? Here's a fact. Here's a fact. We have walked in non-victory in the past. Why in the world would you want to continue to walk in that? You did that. We did not walk victorious. Why would we want to continue? But this is what people are doing. Why? Because of Satan's slick words. I want to, I want to do those things the Lord said so I can walk in that victory. You see, a victory for me means I can be that much more effective for my brothers and sisters in Christ. 
How can I be effective for my brothers and sisters in Christ if I'm nowhere to be seen? If I'm in my own turmoil? If I'm locked away in a corner in depression? How can I be effective for anyone? No, I'm not going to choose the walk that I was taught by men to walk. I choose the way the Lord describes in the gospel. And I will accept it blindly without proof or anything else because his words bear witness in my soul. That's all I need. I don't need proof. I don't need a thousand books to explain the gospels to me. I trust him. I will follow him. I don't need to debate about it. I've heard people say that. Well, let's have a debate. No, because that's like the the lawyers and the scribes and Pharisees. I'm not adopting their ways. How do you think they feel right now when they know for a fact they crucified the Son of God? Even though it had to be done, they got to feel... Can you imagine? But the Lord intervened. It's the Lord forgive them, for they know not what they do. We have such a loving God. Why would I ever want to walk that path that we walked before, where we did walk in judgment? Where we did have a a little group here and a little group there, and this group talked about that group. Where we did socially gang up on an individual to be a fault finder. Where we were tail bearers. By the way, these are things God hates. These are abominations to the Lord. Anything we do destructive to any of the little ones is included in that abomination. And you know what? They're doing it now. They're doing it because they're compelled to do it by Satan himself. Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He's the author of confusion. Through him, offenses have entered the world. That's why Jesus said, Woe to the man of whom these offenses come. Jesus said, Woe to the man. You know, for the Son of God to say, Woe to that person of whom these offenses come. Can you imagine if the Son of God says, Woe, there's no hope for that individual? No hope. But they couldn't hide what was in their hearts forever. The abundance of the heart comes right out of your mouth. Some people speak good. Some people speak evil. And whatever's in their heart comes out of their mouth. If you listen to a person, listen, I'm I'm going to, if you listen to people, and the guile, and the filth. They say they love God, but every three words they're going to curse? I don't think so. That See, to me, this is just to me. To me, that's offensive. How can someone confess Jesus Christ and curse someone out in two sentences? I'm sorry. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. I hear that all the time. You know what's happened? They become insensitive. They're no longer sensitive. They're no longer vexed. Those are the same people, by the way, that probably can watch pornography and then go talk about the word to somebody. This is how twisted things have become. These things, we have to strengthen ourselves to get away from and to forbid to enter back into our lives. There are things we need to forbid to enter back into our lives. If the Lord is coming back for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, here's a question. Which church are we in? Which one are we affiliated with? That's a question. Because... We're going to fit in one of those categories in the churches in Revelation. I strongly believe that. We're going to fit one of those categories. All of them got warnings except one. 
folks are going to take a break, and I'll be right back. Okay, that was a short break, and I never claimed to be a DJ. We're good to go. Anyway, folks, we have to make uh, we have to make those choices. I'll tell you what. When the Lord said, "Choose ye this thing, this day, whom ye will serve," I took that to heart. I think I do that every day. There's not a day that goes by. I don't remember that. And you know what? Sometimes when we're about to do something that we know God is not going to be pleased with, guess what? I still think of that scripture. You see, because we're not squeaky clean. It's a misconception to think that we're squeaky. No one is squeaky clean. If we were all born holy, we wouldn't need Jesus Christ now, would we? The Lord wouldn't have, he, God would not have had to send his son for that. And you know what that makes all of us? Sinners. Sinners saved by grace. That's what our title is. Sinners saved by grace. Sinners saved by grace. You see, a lot of people who are have that religious spirit, they don't like that term. Sinners saved by grace. I've got some weird emails before. Some emails say, you know, I'm not a sinner. Oh, have to delete that one. I'm being honest. I can't look into those emails. I don't want to hear that messed up logic. The Bible already tells us about people like that. They say they're not sinners. We're sinners saved by grace. We were born that way, born into a world full of sin. We have partaken in that sin. We would be lying to each other if we said, no, I didn't partake in any sin. Yes, you did. We most absolutely did. And you know what? Thank God for Jesus because he said where sin does abound, grace does that much more abound. He knew that even after we were saved, we were still going to do stuff because it's a learning process. It's a learning process. It's us actually getting to know who our Father is who our Savior is. You see, it's the difference between knowing of Jesus, knowing of God, and knowing Jesus, and knowing God. Now, don't get that confused with knowing the mind of God. I'm saying knowing God. That's why it's also called a personal relationship. That's why we need a secret place. You see, if we believe in Jesus Christ, we believe in what he stood for and the things that he did, we also, we also adopt his prescribed way of life. We don't just idly stand by knowing all the words of what he wrote and do nothing. You, when you believe in someone, you join in that individual's cause. That's what happens when you believe in someone. We've read about a great many people. I've read about a great many people. That does not mean I believe in that person. I know about them. I don't believe in them. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in the Heavenly Father. I've gotten emails that said, you trust him, you trust God blindly. Well, my soul bears witness. So to them, I'll say, yes, I trust God blindly. Just like a child would trust their parent blindly. How many infants do you know that are four months old, three months old? They say, oh, don't give me that bottle. Did you wash your hands? Oh, did you warm it to the right temperature? Oh, did you wash this or that? They don't do that. We're infants. The problem is we think we're grown. We do. A lot of us think we're on the same plateau as Jesus. Wrong answer. So long as you're here in the flesh, you're not grown. You're a child. Child of the most time. Infants. Babies. While we may be in kindergarten, the teacher has left the room, but he's coming back. And when he comes back, everybody who's throwing stuff in the classroom, he's gonna they're gonna know they're guilty. Just just, you know what, a child knows the same thing. How many times have you caught a child in the act and they give you this look? Like, oh, you caught me. That's how a lot of people on earth are going to be when Jesus comes back. 
they're going to be caught unaware. You see, a good child in a classroom is sitting there observing the door. They actually watch the door because they know the teacher's coming back. While everybody else is jumping, they're so busy in their own stuff, they can't see who's coming at the door. This is why the bad kids are caught off guard and the good kids are not. You can always tell in a classroom who is not engaged in something. That's the first thing you notice in a classroom, who is not engaged in something. Why? Because they're not moving, and everybody else is jumping around, throwing spit wands and stuff. And so you cast them in the act, and, but something amazing happens. You know what happens? All the children that were engaged get this guilty look on their face. Because at that moment, they know they were caught. When the Lord comes back, it's going to be the same way. People think they have identified when Jesus is coming back. Jesus clearly said, he clearly said, that one, no man knows the day nor the hour. And that two, he comes in an hour you think not. Now, listen to me. If Jesus said he comes in an hour that you think not, right? Then all the times we're thinking he's going to come back, he's not coming. He's going to come in an hour then when we're not aware of it. Not, listen, a lot of people are looking, when they look for him, what's that he's coming back? He's coming in an hour, we think not. It's a surprise. There's still mysteries left in the Bible. Number two, he said the world is going to be caught unaware. Unaware? Wait a minute. Unaware? They're not going to know? If the world doesn't know, then they weren't paying attention to the subtle signs. Subtle signs. Not the obvious ones. Subtle signs. They would disregard the subtle signs. Like the fish washing up on the shores. Subtle signs. The subtle things, like the weather phenomena. And you know what? If you think about it, it makes sense. Because the worst of the worst is reserved. For those who live on You know what said at one point? That the people who lived on earth cursed God for the heat because they were being burned up on the earth. They cursed him. They said, it's your fault. That tells you right there who's going to be on the earth. You can read Isaiah 24 and see it yourself. Very few men are left. What happened to everybody else? Where's everybody else? Now, I'm not, listen, I'm not talking about I won't even speak the term rapture. But I will say this. There's a gathering that's going to take place. More than once. It's right there in the Bible. See, I won't say rapture because that's a controversial subject. But I will say what the word says. Two will be in the field, one will be taking the other left. I will also say this. That you see, it specifically stated that the New Jerusalem was occupied with all the saints when it came back down. How'd they get there? How'd they get there? Why was the New Jerusalem occupied? We'll go through that tomorrow. It's a great, it's a it's wonderful scripture concerning how the New Jerusalem. See, I can share with you my thoughts because I differ from a lot of people. I differ from people. But I know that God's word is real. And I know that a great many people have missed something. You see, there's a different event when it says we'll be caught up together with him in the air and forever be with the Lord. Right? But the dead will rise first. That's one incident. But there's something else everybody's missing. For a great many people are gone. You see that? This is why people aren't going to like me by the end of this study. Because I'm going to give it to you just as the word says it. Not as men say it. Men are taking two events and smashing them into one. One is reserved. One is reserved for Israel. That's when Michael, the prince of your people, he was talking to Daniel, the prince of your people stands up. In the worst time there ever was in history, and the dead rise first, and then those which are alive 
shine as the brightness of the sun, they're changed. That's a different event from something else. There's something before it. And people are already saying in their minds, wait a minute, I thought that was one and the same. No, it's not. That's where the confusion steps in because everybody's mixed those two together. It's two different happenings. Two different happenings. But we'll go over that. Some people will say, there it is. It was there all the time and I didn't see it. Some people will say, I, I think they messed up in the Bible. That's what they'll say. I get emails like that too. That the Bible's actually flawed. That's what I get. That the Bible's flawed. That's what I get. Of course, then Jesus said, Oh, fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. That's what Jesus said in the book of Blue. Jesus called them fools, not me. He said, Oh, fools. You see, because the time is coming. Here's how it's going to work. And this is why the world won't know anything. This is why they won't know anything. It's because they're looking for proof and they're seeking a sign. That's why they won't know anything. They're seeking a sign. And the Lord already said, it's a, you see, this generation we're in right now is an apostate generation. We've kicked out the words of the Most High. We've kicked out. People can no longer bear witness in their soul of the things that are said in the book because they're at the wrong seed, which is probably why it said that they will look upon the beast that was, is not, and will be again, and will wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundations of the earth. Listen to me. They're going to wonder who was never accounted to go to the kingdom in the first place. It's almost like they're going to be looking at something saying, is that, is that my ancestor? Or did I come from, did I come from the God of heaven or that thing? Was I the wrong seed all the time? Because you've got to ask yourself, what would make a person wonder whose names are not written in the book of life and the foundations of the world? That has to be a shaker. And then after that point, all you see is hatred, how they hated God. And they hated God for this, and they hated him for that. After that statement, there's a lot of hatred in the world. You see, but it specifically says they beheld the beast that was not, is, and will be again. And they wondered whose names were not written in the book of life and the foundations of the world. Maybe they found out that they were truly a seed of the wicked one. That goes into the weird side of any talks and conversations because people are so arrogant you can't tell them too many things. They can't. They won't believe it. They don't even believe that angels are in this flesh. They're in the flesh and spirit realm. They don't believe it. They can't get through their heads that UFOs and ETs is just another term for angels, messengers, good or bad. They're angels and, and watchers. They can't get that through their heads. It's the same thing. Different term. Different term. But but there's not a lot of time left. And see, instead of stumbling around theories and ideas, we need to go straight for the Word of God. Straight for the Word of God. I know me within myself, that, that's why I don't really get into theorizing. Theory. Forget theory. I don't have time for theory. If your arm fell off, you don't want a theory how to get it back on. You want it fixed, right? If you broke your leg, you don't want a theory on how it might, you know, be healed. You want it fixed. I don't have time for theories. I really don't. I need the Word of God. I'm finding more and more every day. And listen, I'm growing every single day. I'm growing. I am still growing. I don't think a day will come when I'm not growing. You know why? Because I thirst and hunger after righteousness. 
I need to know who Jesus was in his fullness. So if I can absorb every single thing written in this book, then so be it. But I want to know who Jesus was. I need to conform to him, not to mankind. I need to conform to him. I need him. He doesn't need me. If I'm going to make it, because I absolutely believe it. So the next step after you believe something, you want to make it, right? If I'm going to make it, it's only going to work how he established it to work. He is the architect, the designer. I'm not going to follow men's ways. No, no. Men's ways are, in fact, men's traditions. I go against the grain on that. Matthew 15, 9, But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. No, thank you. Teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And then he's not going to hear it when they teach the doctrines of the commandments of men. The commandments of men are the laws of men. Teaching the laws of men. Yet they lump that in with the Bible and then they worship God. And God and, and Jesus said in Matthew 59, but in vain they do worship me. Teaching for the doctrines, the commandments of men. No, I don't have time for that. I, that won't be a part of my spiritual life. You know, the Lord said for us to walk in the spirit, to die to the flesh daily. That's a fine line. But you see, it's also imposing anger. You tell me one good thing that has the fruit of the flesh. And I'll show you where Satan is, no matter what you call it. You know why? Because you'll know a tree by its fruit. Be careful. You'll know a tree by its fruit. Period. You will know a tree by its fruit. Now, Jesus tells us all these things for our growth, that we may be wise. If we consider his words, wisdom will enter. But if we sit there and our flesh rises up to challenge him, because that's what your flesh does. The flesh, when you start to read that, now, who can explain this? You can read the internet all day, all day, never get tired. You can read a chat message, chats all day. You can read text messages all day. Sit yourself down in your secret place and go read the Bible and watch what happens. Watch what your flesh does to you. You'll begin to notice pains you didn't notice earlier. You're hungry. You're thirsty. And then if it doesn't work on you physically, like you get just amazingly tired, right? Too many words start jumping into your head. If you don't press through that barrier, you'll just close the book. You'll close the book. See, when you get into the Word of God, you have to, there's a barrier there called your flesh. And the evil ones think you have to press through. I mean, just right off the bat. Yes. You can sit there and read the internet all day long. All day long without getting tired. You know why? Because your flesh is drawn to drama. And your spirit is drawn to true instruction. The true words of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's what your spirit is drawn from. That's how it is nourished. But your flesh is not nourished by the word of God. It's destroyed by the word of God. So you have to feed your flesh drama. So any drama out there, your flesh will not stand against you. Let's go to Thessalonians 2, Carol. Now notice, Carol, before we go to Thessalonians 2, listen. Because every word in the Bible is defined. In Matthew 59, it says, But in vain they do worship me, teaching for the doctrines the commandments of men. Right? Traditions of men are destructive. Teaching for the doctrines of men are destructive. Not the traditions of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
men's traditions are dangerous. Difference. Very clear difference. Did you get that? Who wrote that anyway? I forgot that quick. Good lordy, help me with my memory. Anyway. But you know what? I could go into a subject about the traditions of men that would just infuriate most people. It would infuriate them because it's one of the strongholds on the flesh. I still am reminded of that dream of the giants holding on to the garbage and the foundations of those castles. The giants would not let them loose, but the instruction went out to steal all doors with the giants in there. Those giants or what you grew up with, the understanding in the world that you have. They're giants and strong. They're not letting go of the garbage. They're not letting go of the garbage. Anything that exalts itself above God is not good. Remember that term. Anything that exalts itself above God is not good. I don't care how close to the Word. You know, Satan says things from the Word. And he's rebuked often. Men take it a step further. Anything that exalts itself above God is not good. Understand that. God's Word is God's Word. But if, if men make up things... That's men. That's not God. You know that fine line between iniquity? It's not going to jump in your face and go boo. He's very sneaky. He's very sneaky. Do you think a drug addict went out into the street and said, I think I want to be addicted to drugs. Do you think an alcoholic made the decision one day to say, I think I want to be an alcoholic? They did not. Those things happen in small steps. Most evil things dealing with Satan, they happen in small steps. It happens over the course of years. Small steps. Satan is not going to jump out and go, boo, he doesn't want you to know it's Satan. Because when a thief is caught, he has to pay back sevenfold. You see, if you identify Satan working in your life, you have authority over him. You have power over him. He doesn't want that, so he hides himself. And he makes you blame other people. That's why most people, most people who get addicted to something, they never blame themselves. It's always somebody else's fault. Why? Because they adopted that habit of Satan hiding from them. They can never find the true target. So they make one. They defend their habit. And it takes the power of God to break those things. If Satan has, those are strongholds. Those are strongholds upon people's lives. And the Lord stands ready to deliver but so long as we keep pointing to our brothers and sisters saying they are the problem, Satan can continue to work. If I point at you and say you're the problem, and I've just totally thrown out the scriptures, we war not against the flesh, but a principalities and powers, I'm identifying the wrong thing, which gives Satan a license to continue working. So long as he's not caught, he can work in your life. You won't rebuke him, nor will you resist him, but you'll engage him every single day. That's his power, to be engaged. That's why it's not good to join into debate about biblical things. We don't know enough to debate. We debate opinions of what we think, but what we think without salvation would cost us eternity. We don't know enough. 
We don't know enough to challenge God if we truly believe in him. People have different ideas. Well, I'm not concerned about ideas. I'm concerned about enduring until the end to finish this race. To do the work, to live the way Jesus said to live in this book, in the Gospels of Jesus Christ, that's my concern because through it is the only way I can be effective to anybody else. I can't be effective to anybody else absent the prescribed way of life Jesus Christ gave to us. It's not going to work. Listen, I've tried it my way. You know what happens with my way? It fails, and it fails miserably. We've all tried it our way. And it failed. Miserably. We tried it men's ways, and they took advantage of us. They did took advantage. We tried it many ways. All of them failed. Most of you, absent the spies, are marked, so you'll never make it in the world. You see, when you belong, when you're a child of God, the world does not want you. It needs you to be destroyed. The children of Satan can prosper in Satan's kingdoms. You can't. Something will always keep you from that because they seek to kill you and destroy you. And it doesn't do any good to kill you in your body. They want you to turn against the Lord your God. That's what they want. They want you to doubt him. They want you to walk around in unforgiveness. They want you to turn away from him. They want you to put all your trust in science, in new doctrines, you see, the world can show you and demonstrate their power. They have their proof because they create things. We have to have faith to believe in the Father by the way which pleases him. The Lord does not come out to demonstrate things. In fact, he said it's a wicked generation and ask for a sign. That means you're not going to believe anyway. If, if you're asking for a sign, right? That means you don't believe. It really means you don't believe. See, if you're wicked on the inside, your soul is not going to bear witness to the words of Jesus Christ. And he did say, my sheep hear my voice. That's what he said. That's that part of that bearing witness. You can read certain scriptures. And it's not that you were convinced. It complemented what you already knew. It was just written down. Most of us read scripture and we say, I knew that was the way. You see, because your soul is bearing witness. Some of the things in the Bible you already knew in your spirit. And you were fascinated that it was already written in the Bible. Yet you'd never read it before. But you fascinate yourself by saying, I knew, but it was it's in there. It's in there. That's your soul bearing witness because Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. That lets you know who you belong to. So don't ever think you're gonna make it in the world. To love the world is to have enmity with God. Remember that. The world does not like you. Though you've been given power over all scorpions and serpents, which are physical things, all spirits are subject to you through the name of Jesus Christ, which are spiritual things, and over all the power of the enemy. You've been empowered. But how do you nullify a person who's been empowered to defeat you? Here's how you do it. You make that person believe I'm not really your enemy. See, if you had a weapon against me, and I was the enemy, it will be my job to convince you I am not your enemy. After you believe I'm not your enemy, I can spend time with you, form a relationship, and then turn you against the very one that gave you your armament. That's how Satan works. It's also how it works on the battlefield.
the Lord said he would not have us ignorant concerning the devices of the plans. Now, his plans, his schemes, his plots, he's not going to have us ignorant concerning those. He will look time what the devil is. He has come to kill, steal, and destroy. He is the author of confusion. Through his vessels, offenses enter into this world. Anybody who has those same traits, you know what seed they're from. Remember Matthew thirteen thirty-seven through 43. It was talking about the good seeds in the world and the tares. The tares are the children of the wicked one. Their father is the devil. The enemy that sold them is the devil. The good seed, the good seed are the children of God, of the kingdom. Who sowed them? The son, of, the son of man, or Jesus sowed them. His gospels. You're either from the Father or you're from Satan. One or the other. Satan is the author of confusion. Confusion comes in. When things are not clear, and the Lord certainly clears things up. But Satan will cause confusion through very slick wording and every avenue he can. Be watchful of this. Just remember Satan's traits. I, begin to identify him. Stop pointing at people and say, oh, there's, there's one of those, uh, the, the wicked one, the tares. Lord, have mercy. And remember, you have to pray for your enemies. You have to love your enemy. The day you realize what the kingdom of God actually is, the kingdom of God, we're not talking about the earth. We're not talking about the sun, the solar systems, the universe, the galaxy, anything. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the kingdom of the creator of all things, his kingdom. Once you understand that you're in that kingdom, then you'll understand who you are. And once you understand who you are, you'll begin to see babies all over the world. You can love your enemy as yourself because you'll see them as babies. Folks, we're going to take a short break, and I'll be right back. Okay, we're back again, and I'm not a DJ. Folks, again, thanks for putting up with me. I hope I'm not rambling. Hope I'm not rambling. But when you see the devices of the enemy, you can't help but to warn. It's a baiting tactic Satan is using. He knows that if he can get you to judge another, you're going to be judged. If he can get you to condemn someone, you're going to be condemned. That's why I said leaders are, are stumbling blocks in front of many people. But men, as men, and as women, a great many of us have lost our fear of the Lord. Somehow, somehow, we have forgotten that we're saved by grace. We have forgotten it all. Somehow we've done that. We disregard the fact that we were in the world and we look upon those in the world as though they're distasteful. When all we're doing is looking at ourselves. We stray away from the Gospels of Jesus Christ. And we go directly into other things. But, the Gospel of Jesus Christ will be an intimate part of COT. You know why? Because we can't afford to walk outside of the will of God. Destruction awaits for anybody who walks outside the will of God. We do that knowingly. That's like tempting. Tempting the Lord. We can't do that. And we know the Lord wants to give us the kingdom. You guys know that? Luke 12.32 says that exact thing. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. His good pleasure to give you the kingdom. These words in the Bible are for us. 
to lead us, to guide us. It's wisdom for us. So that we can, we don't walk or lean onto our own understanding. Listen, this is very important. If you lean onto your own understanding, you could be in big trouble. Let me tell you why. There were times in my life, and I can only use myself as an example, there were times in my life when I thought I found the way to something. I thought, right? So I applied it the next time, and it didn't work. So I learned another way, and I took both and applied them to another time, and they didn't work. And I said, I thought for sure this is the way it worked. Nope. So you see, if we lean into our own understanding, knowing that each individual circumstance is different, if we apply what we've learned from previous circumstances, they won't always work in the future. But the Lord gave us a sure way to avoid a great many things. You see, because I'm telling you, he has laws in this earth that no one can escape. I have not seen a person yet that woke up in the morning and escaped gravity. Gravity is a law. Reaping and sowing is a law. Reaping and sowing is one of the biggest laws that takes hold of a Christian, and they don't even understand it. If you judge, you're going to be judged. If you condemn, you're going to be condemned. If you fail to forgive, you're not going to be forgiven. That, that's reaping and sowing. Every single day we sow seeds that are going to be in our personal harvest while we're living. Every day we sow seeds. If we speak against someone, somebody's going to speak against us. We, we sow these seeds, and then when something that's the same thing that we did comes upon us, we say, oh, I just, Lord, help me. Well, no, because now you're enduring a law. He's not, not going to let it take you. He's not going to do that. But he will certainly let his law work up to a point. Satan tries to bait you into voiding things of the Father to make your life miserable. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So, of course, he wants you to sow bad seeds and lean onto your own understanding, thinking that you have the answer. And your answer may work for a while, and then it's going to blow up in your face. That's the way he works. He wants you to be confident about your own understanding so that you never open the Bible and seek the word of the Lord for a solution. He doesn't want you to seek the word of the Lord for a solution. He doesn't want you to have a problem and to say, well, I think I need to go investigate Proverbs. Or I think I need to go in the Gospels and see how to handle this situation. He doesn't want you to do that. And you know what the sad part is? It's working. He is deceiving a great many people. There are a lot of people who cannot hear the words in the Gospel anymore. They can't. They don't read out of it. They don't accept it. They, too, are thinking that Jesus was just another prophet. Three years ago, these were good Christians. Even the title, Christian, is putting a bad taste in people's mouths. Not from without, but from within. You associate the word Christian with greedy people. Hypocrites. All manner of things. When the word Christian means Christ-like, and that shouldn't be. Because we're children of the Most High. He wants us to know Him. Remember, He does not need us. He loves us. He loves us. He wants us to have a way back home. He gave us a way. Now, Satan's trying to keep everybody from taking that way back home. Satan knows he's going down, and he wants to take you down with him. He wants to take you down with him. He knows he's doomed. He wants you to be doomed, too. And, and he's using a great many avenues to do it. 
a great many. He's very deceptive. I look at the things that are happening. I have an interest in geology. I have an interest in technology. I have an interest in flight, in aerospace engineering, robotics, and things of that nature. And you know what? Through all those disciplines, they deceive you in this way. When you see something happening in the heavens, the first thing you do is you say, well, I'm going to go see on the Internet what NASA has to say. Three days before, you just said NASA were liars, right? Now you go to NASA to verify all your facts. This is what we do. It's what we do. We do this. We do this because we actually, despite what we say, we trust NASA. In fact, how many of you have with your own eyes seen the beautiful rings around Saturn? How many? With your own eyes. Don't tell me you've seen it through a photo either. How many with your own eyes have seen these things? How many? Anybody? Anybody went to Saturn lately and saw the rings? No? Me neither. I ain't seen the rings. You see, the only way we can see these external bodies is through who? The European Space Agency and NASA. That's it. We don't trust NASA, but we will proclaim to the top of the mountain that Saturn exists and we have not seen it. That it has rings. We let them plot the stars for us and we trust all their information. Do you know why we trust their information? Because science makes toys like computers and PDAs. We're fascinated by technology, believe it or not. And you know what? Because you don't understand how to build it yourself. You trust the person that does. In fact, you won't even question them. You won't do it. So they can present to you whatever they want to present. So if you saw something streaking through the sky... And NASA pops up and says, well, that was a piece of space junk. I knew that's what it was. You didn't know what it was. You're trusting NASA. And and four days later, if NASA said, well, um, there's something in for Earth that might hit it, I don't believe that. Now you don't believe him. Here's the problem. We believe what we believe to support our own ideas. We do. Some people don't believe things because of fear. They don't want to hear it because of fear. But this is what I'm trying to say. We place our trust in men who present us things that we deem as facts. We have not seen any of those planets with our own eyes. We've seen pictures. We've seen a great many things all over the place. But we trust them as our information givers. If you read something in a history book, listen, nobody has ever seen George Washington. How do you know that was a real person? We don't. We've not been there. How do we know these things? We don't. Here's what, see, there are things that do not bear witness in your spirit. There are things that do. But I'm telling you this to tell you you've been programmed by the world to believe in whatever they want you to believe for their interest. Because here's the bottom line for every nation. All citizens must serve that nation. Here's their job. Here's their job. I'm going to sum it up just so you know. Their job is to make you a productive citizen to serve the machine. Everything you've ever done in life, your aspirations and everything, are to serve the system. If you think of a way... To make money without serving the system is not going to last. If you think of a way to serve the system and make money, you'll do it. You'll be able to do it. Everything you've been taught is to serve the system. Now, we got this from men, right? But when you read the words of Jesus Christ and it bears witness in your soul, you know what happens? All that previous knowledge fights against the word of God. Then one day you wake up and your soul bears witness to a great many things in the gospels of Jesus Christ. And the first thing you notice is this. 
They lied to me. This is the first time you knew this. They lied to me. Then you begin to question everything. Well, if that's untrue, how much is untrue? Then you get sad. Because you don't know what to believe anymore. Yes, you do. You believe the words of Jesus Christ. But listen, here's the sad part. Because you did wake up. And you found out that the history you once believed in may not have actually been factual. Things may not be factual. That politicians are corrupt and this, that, and the other. It's not the pretty world they presented it to be. You also begin to question the word of God. In fact, if somebody shows you a falsehood, you question everything in your life at that point. That's when Satan steps in. But he sets things up methodically. Before that event hits most people, he'll cause an argument with you and a Christian. Because he's watched you all your life and he knows your habits. He knows when you're about to have a... Down. ...to further his cause. Right now he's trying to make people hate those in Christianity. If he can do that, before he gives out, he rolls out his next demonstration. A great many will fall away. A lot of people say, oh, don't, 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 uh, don't pay attention to this, that, and the other, to political events. It's just, just happenstance. You know, things always end. No, it's not. It's tied to the times that we live in. We can see that everyone's emotions are heightened. The smallest thing can set a person off these days. There is real hate, real hate everywhere. Real hate. This same hatred will surface with the slightest of demonstration. It will turn racial. I can foresee this turning racial. You know why? Because people have to have someone to blame. Listen to me closely. Because men and women have to have someone to blame, which furthers anger. Well, before I say that, let me say this. If everybody accepted responsibility for everything that went wrong outside of them, there would be no hatred in the world. I'll say that first. In the family unit, if one of the parents accepts responsibility for everything that goes wrong, there's no argument. But that's not the case. You know what they do? They're constantly trying to make the other partner realize how bad they messed up. That's when relationships go sour. Why? Because they become accusers of each other. They begin to accuse. That's right before the breakdown. What is happening in the world now? What do you see in the world now? You see accusations flying. I'm not talking about your normal political accusations. We're, we're talking now it's country to country accusations. It's in our leadership. It's entered into the minds of children. And when things begin to touch the children, it's gone too far. All the while, people are falling away from the faith. See, what they don't realize is the more people who fall away from the faith, the more people who join the kingdom of Satan. You're on one side or the other. So everybody that falls away from the faith joins Satan in his cause. Period. And the Lord told us what he would do with this iniquity. As this iniquity grew, he warned us what he would do. He told us what he would do in Isaiah chapter 24. Starting at five, starting at three, he said, The land shall be utterly empty and utterly spoiled. For the Lord has spoken this word. The earth mourneth and fadeth away. The world languisheth and fadeth away. The haughty people of the earth do languish. The earth is also defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinances, broke the everlasting covenant. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. Few men left? There are few men left 
in the world. All joy is darkened. Cities are left in desolation. There's crying for wine, but there is no wine. Because of iniquity, the earth is under a curse. You are the only people out there, you, the true believers in Jesus Christ. Everybody who truly believes in Jesus Christ, you're the reason your nation is still operating and functioning. You are. Not your leadership, not the laws that they have, but the occupants that inhabit those cities. Egypt would have been utterly destroyed to pieces if the Israelites were not there. There are a great many places that would have been destroyed if the Israelites were not there. The places were spared for a little bit, just so God's people could escape. And then destruction came, like Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, great uh, uh, Egypt, which is utterly laid waste. If you guys went back to see what the historians wrote about Egypt in the time of Moses, you would be horrified. You are the reason things are being held back. That's why it has to be a great falling away first, and that man of perdition has to be revealed. By the way, that goes hand in hand. This man of perdition will be revealed as the great falling away happens. And yet, we still toy with the Gospels of Jesus Christ. The line is fine. We're either standing for the kingdom of God we're standing for the kingdom of Satan. There is no middle line. None. No middle line. We have to, we can't walk through life with an identity crisis. And if we say we love our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, then we need to do what he asked us to do. We just read the scriptures. Or he said, why call me Lord and you don't do what I say? Why are you calling me Lord when you don't do what I say? We can't afford to be that way. You see, we want him when we're in trouble. That's what happens. When you're in trouble or facing danger, you'll do everything the Lord wants you to do. Because you want to avoid the trouble. Here's the problem. When you have freedom, you start messing up. You say, oh, I'm secure. I'm going to do this, this, I'm going to go out here and do this sin one more time. It won't be a big deal. I'll repent later. That's what happens when you have freedom. And so you wonder why you're in bondage. Some people have to be kept in bondage because they're not mature enough to handle the freedom. And the Lord does not want to lose you to the world. The same way you got saved, you were stripped and backed into a corner. Nothing was working for you. And you needed the Lord to deliver you. You know what, you, 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 science, here's something else that we were typing in the chat room. You guys do know that the Antichrist worships a God of forces, a God that his fathers knew not, right? The God of forces. Now, I know a lot of people want to equate that to ancient gods. But here's what they have to realize. The ancient gods had modern-day names, but they were just spelled differently. I'll give you an example. Scientists existed back then. Physics had a name. It was an ancient god. They called subjects gods back in those days. The god of forces. He worshipped the god of forces. What does that sound like? That almost sounds like physics. Forces. Science involves all the forces that they have to study and have disciplines for to mimic what happens naturally in, in nature, whether on a big scale or small scale, like the computer. What you see in the computer was inspired by nature. Numerical data, binary numbers, all inspired by natural processes. This guy worships the God of forces. Now, not to jump off the hammer, but you guys know that there are a great many stories out there that who showed man... I'm going to answer a question. How in the world does a man wake up one day and said, ah, 
I think I'll invent some electricity. How's that happen? But if you go back and read their own handwriting, they were talking and communicating to spirits that were giving them formulas, that were inspiring them. Yes, they had dark sides. Just like the fallen angels came, and what did they do? They shared knowledge with men that God intended them to learn in time as they were able to handle it, not all at one time. And so in the book of Enoch, it, it, it conveys what they were teaching men. And they did the same thing again. These angels, and the Lord said in, the, in this kingdom before his, that they would mingle their seed with man's seed, but they will not cleave. Now, here's what's funny. Somebody said, well, they're talking about political differences. So you mean politicians are not human? You say they will not mingle their seed. They would mingle their seed with man's seed, but would not cleave. Cleave means to touch or to hold or to mate, to have relations. They're not going to do it that way. Isn't it funny that in these days, what do you hear about? The subject nobody wants to discuss? How people are snatched up by ETs, I'll call them fallen angels. And they extract reproductive components out of the human beings and make hybrids. Everybody thinks that's a joke, right? They think it's a joke. What they don't tell you is a great many people who have died from doing that. Those things actually happen. Then they say, well, the triangle ships that you see are the TRV-3. That would be fine and dandy, except there are photographs from the 20s, including that same vehicle. Interesting. That's not, they had TRV-3s in the 20s? I don't think so. They won't tell you how watchers are still around the earth, and that's written in the Bible, that new watchers. Listen, there are watchers. The first ones fell, but there are new watchers. They don't tell you that these fears showed up one day and shut down all the defense computers on the globe. They won't tell you that. If these stories got out to the public in the masses from what people call prominent science, authoritative figures that they're used to, they would lose power the same day. They would say, yep, God is real, and uh, I'm no longer listening to you those in the government. That's what would happen. People don't know how close we were to a, to a to a big global fallout that day because all the launch codes and all the systems were changed. The recruiting computers stopped all around the globe. Nobody could recruit anybody. All the defense computers were shut down. The codes were changed. People were locked down. You know how many witnesses there were? There were millions of witnesses. Millions of witnesses. Nobody talked about it. Nobody talked. Yeah, a couple times. Nobody talked about it. Do you know what's still happening today? There are things happening overseas that people couldn't possibly fathom and understand. Missiles being turned away. Deflected. Vanishing. Disappearing. But the same people that will say that does not exist. Right? When they see it themselves, then they'll go tell you the same thing. Oh, that exists. You know what the problem is? We think angels are little ceramic, fuzzy little people that you put on fireplace mantles. We don't believe in, we, we say we believe in God, but as soon as something, one of, something of his shows up, we have a problem with it. while people are enduring the demonic entities that also travel in ships, which is ignored. You know what a great many people don't know that they have authority over these things, and that they can rebuke them in the name of Jesus, and they just, boop, they're gone. They don't have to endure what they endure, but one trick about Satan is this. If he can have you to lean onto your own understanding, 
You will not use the authorities in the Gospels of Jesus Christ that are promised to you. And if you don't use your authorities, those things can do what they want, because you'll never be in a position to rebuke them. Why? Because you're leaning unto your own understanding. You're going to see more and more people inviting what they call the, these good witches to cast out demons out of homes. I'm telling you the truth. You're going to hear stories about this. They're going to attempt to convince people that there are good witches that can cast demons out. Now, to us, that sounds that sounds outlandish, but to the world, it's real. The Lord tried. He attempted. He told us. He didn't attempt. He told us how to walk in the victory. And you know what people choose to do? They choose to walk on the edge. He told us how to walk in victory, but we walk on the edge. We still have to teeter with sin. We're not satisfied unless we have drama. Don't worry. Everybody's going to know in a couple of years. Not one soul on earth will be oblivious to the true nature and what the world contains. And yes, I said it first, in a couple years. Not one soul will be oblivious. Back to the Word of God, anyway. These things are there. These things are there. God's Word is true. What do you think Ezekiel saw? What do you think you saw, Ezekiel? Everybody ignores that. What do you think a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night is? A pillar. What do you think that is? People just simply don't believe God's word. Wouldn't a pillar be like a column turned on its side? I think about things like that. A pillar of clouds. Ezekiel saw wheels within wheels. One guy in the Bible went to go get some, uh, he was sent to go get some food or something. And he came back 24 years later and everybody was old. He said, what happened to everybody? I went out to go get, uh, to go get this food, and, and, and everybody's either dead or changed and old. They said, that was that was 40-some years ago. We sent you out when you were a little kid. But to him, no time passed. The story's in the Bible. Just saying. People believe in demonic entities, but they have a fear that they exist in the flesh. You know what the Bible told us? Be careful to entertain, entertain angels, because you... Be careful to entertain strangers because you entertain angels unaware. That's what it said. Somebody can walk right past you and he'd be an angel and you wouldn't know it. That's why it was written, be careful to entertain strangers because you entertain angels unaware. It told you that you would entertain or interact with them unaware. You're not going to know it. You're not going to know it. Then we get into the book of Revelation, and no one wants to believe that these things can actually happen. No one. Don't worry, Jeannie. After this, if this is just Tuesday, it's going to get a lot more interesting. I expect to see probably, it'll be three left in here by the time I'm finished. But it's coming straight from the Word. You see, the difference between me and other people is I have no motive. You know what my motive is? Love. I know what will happen if people see things they don't think. If, if something is not supposed to exist, and it does not matter who sees it, it's going to do something to you. I know what I'm talking about. You can be the strongest person in the faith that you think you are. 
and fall flat on your face from fear. Your body will seize up on you. I'm telling you, I know what I'm talking about. Your spirit will be willing to stand, but your flesh will freeze up on you. And it's not because they're pretty or ugly either. It's the sensations are overwhelming. The sensations are. I'll give you an example, and I won't go any further. This will be a Saturday's topic. Anybody out there listening to me, have you ever gone to sleep and heard a sound like this in your head? Have you ever heard that? Anybody out there? Have you ever heard that? I won't go any further. That's not a joke or a human condition. It's not a joke when you dreamed and everything turned gray. But it's weird. How can you have a dream with no color? That doesn't make sense. Anyway, you see, these things cannot win against you. You belong to the Lamb. This is why you shouldn't have any fear now. And this is why you should take advantage of every hour that you have. Because the words of the Lord Jesus Christ were given to us so that we could read them and gain wisdom. So that we can understand he wanted us to know who he was and who he is and who he will be. He needs us to understand who he is. Through his words, we are empowered with truth. And the truth will what? Make you free. Not set you free. It will make you free. The truth will make you free. Which means it'll break chains off of your life. See, if you make someone free, you have just cut everything off of their life. You broke all the chains. They're gone. The truth will make you free. As I get close to having no real responsibilities, you guys may get tired of me in COT. By the way, the site is changing. Great many tools in it. I'm a pretty decent um, programmer. I like programming. I like to create. More importantly, I like things that help other people. So if you can benefit from them, I'm going to put Mark to work, 777. If we, if we can have you guys benefit from the site, that'll be awesome. Our first module should be posted uh, this weekend or Monday, the first module. It's going to come in chunks. There are changes being made right now and already. It will come in chunks. But we need it to be a good site because we have to move on with the Word of God. There are certain subjects, and I understand, that people cannot talk about. But you know what? This is a living room. We talk about the word of the Lord. We share ideas and everything else. We don't want to share lies in here. I want to share truth. I want you guys to share truth. Some of you will be talking. Share truth. Don't share the lies. Share truth. That's just like a dream. If you have a dream and you tell someone, tell someone exactly how you had it. Have you ever told someone a dream and then later on you missed a detail or you may have altered it unknowingly, and then later on you remember the detail you left out and said, Dog, I wish I would have told them that little detail. That was the detail that was necessary to lock the entire dream in. Tell it just as you saw it. Don't add to it or take away, but tell it as you saw it. Then if it's important and makes sense, believe me, if it's sent from above, it, uh, it's going to have great understanding at its appointed time for it to take effect. But if you change one thing, it'll change the whole story. It could ruin the insight the rest of us could have had through your dream or through your experience. We're all vessels, and the Lord uses his vessels. That means what you have to say is important. So long as it doesn't come from self, if it comes from yourself, right, if you're emotionally led to say it, hold it to yourself. 
Because we can be emotionally led to say a great many things. Hold that to yourself, the emotional things. We want to know the truth and those things that are truthful as close as we can get to the truth. And we want to hear it in context. So nobody else comes around picking it apart and deems you as crazy. They can deem me as crazy all they want to. I'm fine with that. You know why? Because I know exactly who I am. See, when you know who you are and what you stand for, what other people say won't penetrate or bother you. That's when you know who you are and what you stand for. If you don't know who you are and what you stand for, somebody says something, it can knock you off balance. I'm not knocked off balance. I know exactly who I am. I know what I'm capable of. I know what I stand for. I love the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And believe me, I fear him that can kill both the body and the soul. I do not fear any person that can kill my body. But I still fear the Lord. When you walk through life like that, that kind of makes you humble. That makes you humble. Because you realize that the Lord does matter and what he created does matter. That means you matter. And who's the apple of his eye? You are. That's in another scripture too. How the children of the Lord are the apple of his eye. We know he has his land called Israel, but I'm talking about the children. The children of the Lord. And you know what? We always hear that term, children of the Lord. And we need to hear something else, too. In the book of Matthew, it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. I said that today on Pastor Paul's, which means if you're not a peacemaker... If you are the one of which offenses come through and you're reveling and doing everything the Lord Jesus said not to do, you're not his child. A parent knows their children, and the children know the parent. But there are other children in this world that we need to know. Folks, those folks who come with this hatred, and I have to mention this again, these people, you need to watch for the people who will seduce you in hating another. You need to stay away from double-hearted people. There's a scripture for that too. There's a few scriptures about that. Don't second guess your walk with Jesus Christ. A man who puts his hands to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God that's written in the Bible. Don't look back. Keep going forward. If we all look back, we see a mess. It's filthy back there. And it smells bad where we are. But there's cleanness ahead of us. You see, our flesh is filthy. It's already contaminated, polluted. There's no way you can go back in the past and change that. What's done is done. But what do you have? You have right now, and you have the hope of glory. You focus on Jesus Christ, his words, what he stood for, what he asked you to do, what he accepts as a child of the Most High. You see, God accepts a characteristics of his people. He said, if you're one of mine, you're eventually going to be like this. You need to find out what those things are. Don't walk in the way or sit in the seat of the scornful, which is what a great many people are doing, sitting in the seat of the scornful. They're scorning everybody else. Don't do that. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you'll be a part of the gospel of peace. You will be a peacemaker. You will be, you'll, you'll be merciful and meek. You'll hunger and thirst for righteousness. You will conform to what Jesus was asking us to perform. You'll understand that you have authority, so you won't have to demonstrate it to every person you meet. See, there's another problem. When you know you're powerful, you don't need to demonstrate that power. Because it's not made for flesh. It's made for the spiritual realm. 
which often comes into the flesh. You see, if a human being is given a sovereign will, there's nothing you can do about a human being. But you have authority over all spirits through Jesus. All spirits are subject unto you through the name of Jesus Christ. You have power to tread upon scorpions and serpents. They are flesh and blood creatures with venom, which means words and circumstances and so forth in your life. And you have all the power over the enemy. Everything you need, you're equipped with. Satan's trying to deceive you to think that you can use that against people, and it does not work against people. It's his spirits are subject unto you through the name of Jesus. It says all the power, you have all the power of the enemy. Never once did it say people were subject unto you. Don't use it against people. What is that tribe? Just one let us pray for our brothers and sisters. We forgot that Jesus commands us to love one another and then he will judge yeah, as we as we spoke about last night, because a great many people have forgotten their first love. They didn't start out that way, but we do need to pray for them, because again, we don't know their state. They could be in great pain. Maybe they just don't know. Some people don't know. Some people have been taught that that's the way to be. We don't know their backgrounds. But I'll tell you this. What resides within a man, we're in that season where those hidden things within a person is coming out. We're in that season. It's coming out all over the place. I will go so far as to say you're going to hear some... You know why? Because people are going to say, I don't care anymore. You are going to feel yourself. If you're not careful, you're going to say, I don't care anymore. See, it starts with this. You'll say, I don't care what people think. But what is your cause for saying that? What is your cause? For a scoffer or someone who hates Jesus Christ? I mean, hates. Those are the ones that uh, you just have to go your way from. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, even those who come, who are in the world doing all manner of things, you should care. Your enemy, flesh and blood enemies, you better love them. See, people get that all mixed up. It said, love your enemies. Right? Love your enemies. He wasn't talking about Satan. Love your enemies. Pookie says, Mike, how do you know if you're dealing with a demon or a trial of God? Here, here's, a, here's a good thing. It, here's something simple, right? Because I believe in the Word of God. First of all, you can extract lessons from everything you go through. Second, God is in control of all things. But if you rebuke a demon in the name of Jesus, after you first ask the Lord to have your eyes open, because listen, you go through circumstances and situations for a reason. In that case, you need to pray for discernment. And you have to know you're an overcomer. You see, because it was written that all spirits are subject unto you through the name of Jesus. If you tell a demon to go out of your life, and the problem still exists, you may be in a trial. If you thoroughly meditate upon what you're going through, because sometimes we have to do this, there's something called sowing and reaping, and we find out that we've done that to somebody else in the past, we need to ask the Lord for the strength. To endure what we're going through. Because here, here's something. A lot of us are having, a lot of us are having difficulties. A lot of us are having difficulties. Not all difficulties are demons. A demon is subject unto you through the name of Jesus Christ, period. 
Normally when something does not go, right, it's for you. I've seen people in sicknesses. I've seen people with great, great family issues. I've seen people with quite a few things. Quite a few things. But you see, the Lord has a reason for everything you go through. He has a reason. Everything you go through is for a reason. There's nothing. Once you give your life over to Jesus Christ and you truly do accept him, everything you go through has a reason. Everything you go through. Because he wants you to come home. And sometimes, guess what? It's as painful as this is to admit. Some of us are so thick-headed that the only way we can get it is if we go through great tumult and physical torture. Because we're too stubborn to accept it at face value. We have to be stripped away of everything to understand. You see, when you're stripped of everything, you have nowhere else to look. Nothing else is distracting you. The Lord has your full attention. Everything else has failed you. You at that moment don't believe in anything else. And so the only thing you can call out to is God himself. That's when he has your attention. Now, because he loves you, because he absolutely loves you, he desires that closeness with you all the time. And so if you find yourself back into these corners, then you know you drifted away from him when he desires you to be near him. You're his child. He sent his son for you. So, yes, he loves you and desires you. So when you find yourself back in that corner cut off and things are going wrong, you need to ask yourself, did I really walk away a little bit? Was I slipping back into the same patterns I was before? He doesn't want to lose you. He knows you're an Listen, you're eternal. You're an eternal being. After your body is gone, do you still exist? He knows this. We just find that hard to believe sometimes, or we don't accept it in the course of our daily lives. But he does not want to lose us to the enemy. What do you do when, you, when your child is bad? Punishment is coming. He does us the same way. If your child ran into the street every time they went out the front door, you'd lock the front door. The child will never see the outside again because they keep running into the street. The Lord does you the same way. He doesn't want you to kill yourself. He's watching over you thoroughly. Listen, he knows the number of hairs on your head. Now hear me. Anybody who has counted the number of hairs on your head knows you intimately. Now, the numbers of hairs on your head changes daily. He knows you daily. He knows he's looking at you continuously. He's paying attention to you. He's hearing everything. But we don't like to hear him. He has not looked away from us. If he looked away from us, he would have never sent his son because he wouldn't be able to see us. He looked at us and loved us and sent his son. Now he's mindful of you all the time, every second of every day. And listen, now I know a lot of people have messed a great many people up with this thing, but a day is just a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. You know what that means? Time does not exist to God. That means one second, one second that passes in your time could be five, six hundred, seven hundred years to the Lord. He's carefully examining every aspect of your life. He likely knows every dust particle that hits you. He's aware of all things. Time is for us. It is not for him. Time is meant for man. He is the creator of all things. Existence would not exist without him. To understand, to even think on that level, is to throw away pride, to throw away arrogance, 
to not lean unto your own understanding, to silence the world, and to meditate in the Word of God, to see Him for who He is. I certainly will keep doing it. And for all the spies in the camp, I hope you had a blessed evening. Because I know some of you won't be spies for long. Some will. Either way, God bless you. And those in the CUT family, get, get the updates will be hitting. And uh, we might have three people listening by the weekend, but so be it. So be it. Because you know what? There are some things that, um, things that I know that can help you dealing with those things to come. There are certain things I know you'll never have to face. Therefore, there's no need to discuss that. But there are some things that you probably need some, in, uh, need some info on that will affect you. I found that things that go with the Word of God are the most important things we can hear. Because we end up dealing with them. The words you read in the Bible, you've dealt with them. You've dealt with them. So, folks, we'll do this again tomorrow, Lord willing. Tomorrow is, uh, is Weird Wednesday. We'll probably be on the same subject. But as I have a feeling, things are about to transpire, which is going to make for a very interesting day. So we'll see. Pray for Israel and the occupants. Listen, pray for the Christians in the Middle East, period. Now, I know the Lord's will has to be done, but pray for the Christians everywhere in the Middle East. Everywhere in the Middle East. Pray for Israel, too. Every time I'm near that place, I'm telling you, I feel different. See, to me, it is the birthplace of our faith. The gospel was preached first to them, then to us. Without them, we'd never have the word of God, period. Only Satan's hatred would hate them so much. Pray for them. Pray that the Lord's will be done. Pray for his mercy upon them. You have that power to petition to the Most High God. You have that power to petition because you are, in fact, saved through grace, washed in the blood of the Lamb. You have that power to petition God. And what you ask for collectively, Jesus is in the midst of that request. You have that power to petition. I believe in prayer. You have that power to petition him. He hears you. You don't know what the effect may bring. You don't know what he may decide to do. Because time is made for man. It's not the opposite way around. Time is nothing to the Father he created and remember, nothing would exist without his word spoken. Nothing. Folks, we got to go. We'll close this one out, and we'll continue this tomorrow. I probably will be in the chat room, because I have paperwork to do. So I'll hang around in the chat room a little bit later. Folks, stay tuned for Larry's coming up at 10. And again, we'll be in Pastor Paul's room at uh, 12 noon Eastern time. And Pastor Scott plays at... 3 p.m., uh, and then, of course, I'm scheduled to come in then, so our transmission should be going just about all day long. Folks, I love you. i got to go. Hopefully, I'll see you here tomorrow. God bless everybody.